Whiskey Cast. Proudly brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Join the still house at singlepotstill.com and receive an exclusive whiskey tasting journal. I've been with the company coming up 44 years. I've seen nine takeovers and I'm on my 19th different boss. I don't know how many marketing people I've seen, but a lot in that time. So when I see all these different takeovers, I get a little bit disappointed. In part one of my interview with Richard Patterson at the Victoria Whiskey Festival, we discussed the situation at White & Mackay as UK competition regulators consider a proposal from Diageo to break up the Scotch whiskey producer. But in part two, he answers your questions. Now, our listeners have submitted some questions via Facebook for you. All right. Some are cheeky, some are serious, and I appreciate your being willing to answer some of them for All our right. okay. listeners. Eric Burgess wants to know, first he says he's a big fan of Dalmore. He wants to know if White and Mackay would consider following the Burn Stewart example with, that it did with Deanston, Tobermory, and Lechig a while back and bottle at 46% with no chill filtration. He'd love to try your 12, 15, and 18 Dalmores at a higher ABV. Is that something that could be considered in the future? Right, I, I'm not quite sure what Eric was meaning there because, you know, we have the Constellation Collection. We've got a number of uh, expressions that are at natural strength, no chill filtration, that are already existing out in that market. So, you know, to say that would you follow what's happening at another distillery, whether it be Ben Reak or Glen Cadam or Glen, um, you know, Gengiri or what have you, we, we are like everybody. We're always looking for new expressions. We're looking for differences, something that's innovative, something that's exciting. But whether it be at natural strength or a, a bottling strength or a, a very high strength will depend entirely on the product. But I, I'm not quite sure what he's meaning because we do have a, a, lot of, a lot of expressions out there. Perhaps he's not actually seen them all. But, um, you know, we're, we're always being innovative. We will be creating, following, you name it. You know. are, are there any of the Delmores that are not chill filtered? The ones that are not chill filtered are, are the standard 12. And, and, and let me just immediately say to you, uh, this is a sort of perception that when you uh, chill filter, you sort of take a lot out of the whiskey. Well, we found that that is really not the case as far as we are concerned. But what you must remember is that Dalmore is a, a particular style of malt that if you don't chill filter and we send it our Dalmore at 40% to countries like Canada at the present moment are going through very, very severe temperatures as well as part of America and the whiskey goes cloudy because we have not chill filtered, that causes us more problems. Because the worst thing for us is for the consumer to see a cloudy whiskey. Sometimes we can say to them, oh, by the way, don't worry, that's uh, because it's natural. Actually, the consumer doesn't want to see that. He thinks there's something wrong with it, and then our reputation's ruined. So it's a matter of keeping the balance, whether we chill filter for this age, non for this age, that's the decision we have to make. When it gets to some of the older whiskies, we don't need to chill filter because it's done it over the years in the warehouses and it will not throw that sediment which is uh, natural in its own way but not acceptable to the consumer. Our next question comes from Don Kerr who says, over the last couple of decades we've seen significant increases in the prices of whiskies, as you know, and this has been encouraged by some of the products like the Dalmore with some of the very, rare, very, rare, very expensive bottlings that you've created over the years. Do you see this as being beneficial or detrimental to the overall whiskey industry? And is this a trend that we're going to see continue over the next 20 years? Okay, well, that's a very good question, Don, because first of all, what you must do is uh, say to you immediately, have you got the stocks? The majority of whiskey distillers out there actually have uh, produced whiskies, the natural at four, five, six years. And then, of course, the 12-year-old synonymous, which has been with us and marketed for many, many years. But when you get whiskies up to 60 years old or 50 years old, a lot of distilleries don't have these stocks. So, you know, a lot of jealousies come about this and there is only a few of us that have actually had the vision to hold these stocks that are around about 50 or 60 years old and therefore they command very high prices. For me personally, it's kind of sad that when, like for instance, the Dalmore 64 years old, three bottles sold for 320,000 pounds, people say to me, was it worth it? Well, of course it was worth it. This is 1868, 1878, 1926, 1939. There's only three bottles. And once these three were got and bought, two in America and one in London, 
that's it, it's gone. And it's very sad for me to see these whiskies go. But the reality is, there are very few and far between, and therefore, they command these high prices. But when we're talking about high prices, people should also look at uh, baseball, football. You get these players that are worth millions of pounds, and people say, look at that player, he's worth millions of pounds, millions of dollars, is he worth it? And the clubs buy him. So it, it works the same way. If that's what you want to buy, that's what you have to pay. But remember, once they are drunk, a lot of these whiskies will be never seen before. However, let me just finish by saying this. You can go into the shop and you can buy Dalmore on about the $50, $60 if you want to prepare. And you're going to have that quality around that 12, 15 year old mark. If you want to pay a way up to you know, nearly a million dollars or what have you. Well, that's up there if you can afford it, if you want to buy it. But, you know, don't castigate it. It is, in fact, a quality that is aware and available to everybody in the market. What's the most you would ever spend out of your own pocket for a bottle? I would spend around about 250 pounds or $500. If it, it, because the quality, some of these qualities, and if you take, you know, the uh, Dalmore 25-year-old, around about the $900, that uh, 3,000 bottles, uh, you know, is actually, uh, you know, the 33,000 bottles, should I say, uh, or no, sorry, 3,000 bottles, I beg your pardon, is actually worth everything. And that, that's, that's a tremendous quality. Gavin Ryan Thompson has our next question. He says, with Richard being all over the world, spending time traveling around, creating and doing many tastings around the world, how much time do you actually get to spend in the sample room back in Glasgow? Right, well, the sample, let me, it's a good question again, uh, Gavin, and I would say to you immediately, uh, I actually I'll travel, normally one week at the most and then I'm back in a week and uh, two weeks, three weeks before I travel again. It depends on the demand. But no matter how many samples are coming through or how many blends are coming through, when I return to Scotland, I will see every single expression. Nothing will go off the radar. And even when I'm sitting and sleeping in the middle of the night, the phone, the telex, or not the telex, but the fax machine is still going, but I've got a Blackberry. So I am in contact 24 hours a day so I know exactly what is is going on so my time it could be sometimes 40 percent traveling it could be 50 percent but at the end of the day for the quality it's still sacrosanct and that's what I'll always be devoted to. On that note Lavinia Turnbull has our next question she wants to know if you've selected your replacement or your successor to eventually take over <laughs> a la what David Stewart did up at... Uh, and we've actually, obviously, we've started to look at that, and it's, but it's trying to get that right person. With us going through all these changes at the present moment, obviously that everything's on a hold, but it's not something that's, you know, something we're avoiding. It's something that's very much on our radar. But what you need to do is to find that individual, like uh, Brian Kinsman, who was right. the shadow of uh, David Stewart for around about 10 years. It's getting that same individual to shadow you, to think the same way, and then to take over. He has got, he's going to have his same ideas, and it could be a woman as well. It could be the same, you know, with a woman, with a man, what have you, but he's got to have that passion, that dedication, but that commitment that he can carry on the trend and maintain the quality and the consistency of the product. But it's not an easy job to find that individual out there. Do you have anybody you're working with now? Yeah, with we, we, we've, got, we've, got, we've got one or two people that are on the fringes of the present moment, and I have to say, they're presently working uh, you know, out there in the field. I, I can't say too much, but I already identified potential candidates. Yeah, because obviously there has to be somebody in the wings in case, God forbid, you get hit by a bus or something. Yeah. They have to have somebody who could step in and take over. There, right? There's no question about that because, you know, Margaret, who's been with me for many, many years, she's been with me for 35 years. There are sound bases of maintaining and holding it. The, the, you know, you, you're, nobody's irreplaceable, put it that way. So there are already, you know, uh, steps in place that will ensure the consistency that work is carried on. Now, Lavinia had a follow-up question. This one's a bit cheekier. Who would play you in the movie The Nose? Who plays Richard Patterson? <laughs> who would play me? There was a suggestion Charlie McLean could do it. Who, would, who, should, who should play that role? I'm not very sure. I really don't know. I, I, I just hope whoever does it, they put the same kind of dedication and passion that I like to think that I do because it is a very competitive world. But as long as it's amusing and as, as long as we can entertain, but as long as we can look at Scotch in the right manner, that's what it's all about. Please don't hit me when I ask you this question. Tyler Allison wants to know, which shape of ice do you prefer, large pieces or little small tiny pieces? Well, 
And his, cheek, his more serious answer is, do you ever actually break your no ice rule? Uh, very seldom, very seldom. I, I'll be quite honest with you, because ice, as much as uh, you look at it, it's just something that I'm, I'm, I'm really not happy with at all. But I have to say immediately, if you like it with ice, that's purely up to yourself. What I don't want to do is to think about an aged whiskey that I've spent years trying to create, only to diminish it, only to reduce it. Because whether it's an ice cube, it does melt. It will, in fact, it will vibrate. It doesn't quite, uh, you know, be compatible with the whiskey. It does do it. But why do you add it? Why do you add uh, sugar to coffee? Why do you add milk to coffee? Why do you add cream to coffee? Because people think it's perhaps a little bit bitter. Why do you add the ice? Because it sort of tends to hold it back and masks it and, and tells to take away all the flavors. But it will diminish the flavors that have taken years to create. However, if that's the way you like it, I can't argue with that. I need to correct one thing because it wasn't Tyler who asked the question, do you ever break the ice? Well, that was actually Dave Green. Tyler was talking about the ice, though, on another point, because it was some of the things that you've done in the past, obviously throwing ice uh, at shows and tastings and uh, swirling around the glass and to clean it and then throwing 30-year-old scotch out onto yeah. the floor that got him interested in scotch in the first place. Do you ever... First of all, how did you come up with that idea to do it in tastings and come up with the showmanship part of it? And do you ever think about toning it down just a bit? Well, uh, you can look at it in different ways. It's a good question. Let me just say a, a number of facts to you. For instance, when I maybe throw the whiskey, people say, you know, why are you doing that? Is that for show? Actually, it's not. It's what I do actually in the sample room. And, uh, and I'll be quite honest with you, the person that actually showed me that was Donald McKinley, who was the master blender for the McKinley's blend, who in fact was the man that still holds the original bottle of Shackleton. And what he used to do in the sample room is he used to take the whiskey and shake it like that. But in fact, it, when he shook it, he, he fat put it on the carpet, then he brought it up to his nose. I tend to swirl it around and then throw it because what I want to do is to get the rim off it. But you know, people say to me, you know, uh, you think about toning it down. If I went into a tasting and uh, a wine tasting and said, oh yeah, this is it, this is it, people would be bored. People need to be looked at, entertained, they need to be sat up. If I've got a hundred people, trying to entertain a hundred people is not an easy job. Now, I know for a fact that I'm not going to entertain everybody, but if in perhaps I can get their attention, wake them up a little, but still get the same message, what have we got here? This isn't wine, this is quality, this is Scotch whiskey, and it must be revered, it must be looked at. So if the glass is not right, and I put it on there, well, too bad, because when I look at it next time, it's going to give me an accurate assessment of that whiskey. Ice is the same thing. When I go to countries, like uh, recently I went in China, I saw this guy, he had a, a whiskey glass, and it was covered in ice. And I said, what have you got there? And he told me he had an aged Dalmore worth thousands of pounds. I said, what are you doing with all that whiskey? He said, the barman told me that's how you actually should drink it. And that is entirely not right. It should be only perhaps a small ice scoop, depending on how you like it, but not drowned in ice. So it should be flung away and then re-looked at it in a better way to see all the years that have been put into that whiskey. Now, you've joked about slapping people for holding their glass the wrong way. Yes. Have you ever actually hit anybody for doing that? Yeah, several times, many times. Yeah, and you're saying to me, no, but you can't possibly do that. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm, I believe it. I just want well, to know if you'd actually I, done it or if this is yeah, a shit. Yeah, this, this is actually done on many occasions. The one that stands out to me more than anything was in South Africa. This guy came up and I gave him a 22-year-old blend and he knocked it back and I said, how do you like that? And he said, like what? How did you like the flavor? I said, what flavor? He said, I didn't get any flavor. So I like that. <laughs> so they'll either do two things. When you do that, they'll either say, I'm going to punch you, or they'll say, why did you do that? Because if they're interested. So he said, why did you do that? I said, to get the flavor, you need to hold it long in the mouth. He said, you need to keep it long to extract the flavors. He said, fair enough. So he knocked it back again. And he kept it in his mouth for three seconds. I said, what did you get this time? He said, I got something, but not very much. I went, what, not very much? He said, I'm going to, I said, hold on. I said, what's the age of the whiskey? Oh, now I see what you mean. I said, it's 22 years old. I said, this time I want you to keep it in your mouth for 22 seconds. So and I want to keep it at the top of the tongue, underneath, back in the middle, and then let it go down. And that's what he did. And this time when he put it in his mouth and put it there underneath and kept it, swirled it round, kept it for 22 seconds, he let it go down. 
Suddenly his face lit up and he was smiling. I said, now do you see it? Now I see what you mean. Because my father always told me to knock it back like a cowboy. And I said, I never knew it was like that. I said, it's the same with chewing food. You've got to extract the flavors, take your time. Same with Jackson Pollock. You look at his paintings, you'll see an inner world. That's what he called it, but you give it time. So that's why, look at it. But sometimes you have to go like that, like that, get their or attention. like that, get their attention. And they never forget. How do you want to be remembered? I want to be remembered by people out there who have met me and said, yeah, he was passionate about what he produced what he believed in. When he came to the country, he learned what was going on here. He thought about the individual. When he met, said a whiskey smells like this, what does it smell like? Christmas cake. When he went to Russia, it smelled like, you know, Prague cake. When he went to Scandinavia, it was another thing because all the flavors, in fact, are different interpretations. But he learned it, he looked at it, and went to the consumer to make whiskey exciting and really try to revere what it's all about. Whether you drink a Dalmore 12 or the 64, give it the reverence it deserves. Thank you, my friend. All right, thank you.